All right, everyone, welcome back. Welcome to part two of our coverage of Russia. And we are basically picking up where we left off from part one. Now, what I want to talk about in this lecture is an extension of this subject of Putin's popularity. You know, when we talk about politics in non-democracies, um, there's less of a need to consider political institutions, um, structural procedure, the rule of law, um, largely because these things are at the behest of people in power. So in order to understand politics in Russia, it's really, and I, I, I don't want to sound uh, crass or straightforward here, but or crassly straightforward or straightforwardly crass, um, but it really is um, the leadership, the charisma, and the popularity of someone like Vladimir Putin, who I have to say from the you know, last lecture, um, enjoys routinely uh, popular opinion approval of somewhere between 70 to 80 percent. Now, we can take this number with somewhat of a grain of salt because, you know, opinion polls in Russia can always be somewhat rigged in favor of the, um, you know, of, you know, of, of the pro side. You know, if, if let's say, you know, someone is asked to, uh, you know, give their thoughts, uh, you know, in a phone survey or whatever it is, and, you know, the survey kind of knows who you are, where you live, everything else like that. It might be, you know, strategic to just say, yeah, I love Putin. He's great. You know, you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want any problems or troubles. Um, but you know what? Even if we were to factor that, um, that fear percentage out, right, this idea of just, you know, saying whatever the polling uh, group wants to hear, um, even if we factor that out, um, I think it's... Um, it's more than um, convincing to say that Putin's popularity um, hovers around 60 percent, right, which I said is, um, you know, numbers that uh, elected Democratic leaders would you know, just die for. I mean, they, they really would. Um, and the nature of Putin's popularity has a lot to do with the way in which he is branded to the public, you know, the way in which he uh, markets himself and the way that his supporters um, and, you know, pro-Putin uh, groups sell him to the public as well. And that makes him still today, um, you know, largely blameless for Russia's continued problems, right? And make no mistake about it here, folks. Make no mistake about it, right? 20 years into Putin's presidency, prime ministerialship, whatever it is, Russia still has an enormous amount of problems, right? There are high degrees of corruption still. Um, organized crime is still there, although it has been corralled into uh, the state. Um, public officials are certainly some of the least trusted people in the communities, and there's still a, you know, a running battle between who is the least popular figure, uh, the local mayor or the local cops. Um, but he is somehow seen as above the fray, Right. A way of thinking that, you know, he's working hard for Russia and he's, you know, he's trying hard and he's got all of these problems and all of these challenges. And of course, there's, you know, external criticism of his leadership. There's internal criticism, which are, you know, seen as uh, fifth column elements that are there to destabilize the state. And, you know, you kind of begin to see the way in which, um, you know, a typical Trump supporter will continue to support Donald Trump in the face of overwhelming evidence that he is actively working to undermine the standards of living and the livelihood of many Americans. But they still see him as someone who is, you know, beleaguered on all sides. And if he were just left alone to do his thing, he would, you know, truly make America great. And if you're trying to make sense of all of this, well, don't. OK, it just, just, you know, you, you got to sort of take empirical politics out of the empirical reasoning out of the equation and put in something that is more subjective, right, more normative. Um, and, you know, it's not all smokescreen. I mean, Putin has, you know, produced, um, you know, a clear track record of rooting out corruption, um, eliminating uh, the, you know, the, the, the most egregious patterns of greed from economic oligarchs, um, targeting enemies within the country, right? You know, one of his big things that he was able to do uh, early on in his uh, presidency was reversing Russia's misfortune in Chechnya. 
And, uh, you know, within about five years or so, uh, the terrorist movement that basically um, broke Chechnya away from the country was reabsorbed back in. So, you know, these displays of military power and bringing law in order to places where, you know, lawlessness reigns certainly plays into, you know, his persona. And again, if you compare him to the ineptitude of Boris Yeltsin, suddenly the public sees him as, you know, the sheriff that comes to town that is going to clean up the mess. Um, you know, finishing you know, off of this whole Chechen terrorist thing was really a combination of two things. One, yes, the military was reorganized, re-equipped, retrained, and certainly crushing the separatists, the terrorists within Chechnya, um, increased morale within the Russian army. But there's something else at foot here. You know, if Putin was really going to root out corruption and jail all of these oligarchs and all of these warlords and everything else like that, I mean, yeah, he'd be a paragon of virtue. But what he ends up doing, more than anything else, is he operates in, he operates in the same way as, let's say, the FBI um, targets um, elements of the organized criminal syndicate. By going after, you know, second and third rank mafioso and sort of offering them some form of protection, some form of immunity, if they turn on their bosses, right? So this is kind of what Putin does, is that he, if what, what opposition he can't jail or eliminate, he'll just simply outwardly buy. And when it comes to Chechnya, yes, the separatists were crushed, but Chechnya today is under the quasi-independent leadership of a man by the name of Ramzi Kadyrov. Now, this guy, Ramzi Kadyrov, was bought by Putin, right? His loyalty was bought, and it is annually renewed, okay? So this is a guy that isn't necessarily the main Bond villain, but is the one that spends about 20 minutes fighting James Bond before the Bond villain comes. Like, this guy is criminally insane, okay? Um, he has blood on his hands by literally killing people. Um, he runs Chechnya like his own personal fiefdom. And as long as he keeps the region under control and, you know, sends a certain percentage of, you know, whatever it is that he, you know, embezzles, grafts, whatever it is, back to Kremlin, he's allowed to run Chechnya like, you know, his own personal property. So is Chechnya reintegrated with Russia? Yes. Is it some place that I would recommend going on vacation? Not really. All right. Not really at all. But Kadyrov is someone who, you know, will, you know, bought, will be bought out by the highest bidder. And as long as Putin has the money, Kadyrov does uh, his whim. And in the meantime, you know, works to root out any rival claims to the region, um, including turning on his former allies, in a sense. So, yeah, it's a way of pacifying Chechnya and reversing Russia's fortune from the 1990s, um, but in ways that are far less democratic than one would expect. Um, the same thing happens um, a few years later in Georgia in 2008, right? The former Soviet Republic of Georgia um, is an independent country that has a number of breakaway regions within said country, okay? Now, Georgia's maybe the size of, I don't know, South Carolina or something like that, right? And there's two areas that have kind of been quasi broken away, but not enough to like become their own country. Uh, the regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Now, throughout much of the 90s and early 2000s, uh, this region, both of these regions were within Georgia, operated under Georgian law, but were kind of always hinting, threatening at separatism. Um, during the, and I kid you not, um, this is exactly what happened. During the opening ceremonies of the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, while all eyes were on China, literally the opening ceremonies, the Georgian government decides that it is going to use this opportunity to mobilize its military and try to reclaim control over these two regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, by force if need be, and reintegrate it within the country. As this happens, both of these two regions, um, in, you know, just to make the story move, 
uh, call on Russia for support. Now, Russia has been somewhat supporting them in their separatist endeavors, but Russia never really outwardly um, you know, intervened on their behalf. But Russia is kind of keeping them um, as bargaining chips. And Russia decides now's the time to use this because the Georgian leadership um, under Mikhail Saakashvili uh, was very pro-Western, very pro-American, very, very, very anti-Russian, anti-Putin. So this is a guy that Putin would be more than happy to humiliate. So, you know, Ossetia and Abkhazia call on Russian support. The Russian military responds and intervenes, invades these two regions that border between Georgia and Russia, push back the Georgian military, and effectively occupy both regions. Saakashvili immediately calls on the United States for retaliatory support. Now, this is during the last few months of George W. Bush's term. And Condoleezza Rice, you may remember her as the Secretary of State, um, like openly, just and outwardly rejects any form of countermeasure. Right? She's basically like, um, we're leaving in a few months. Um, I am not getting ourselves involved in a regional conflict with Russia. Um, in so many words, go screw yourself. And I want you to remember this because this does two things. One, it shows that the United States will not get itself involved in regional conflicts where Russia is on the other side. So the United States can maybe push Russia around diplomatically, but they are not going to get involved in a protracted military conflict. That itself is absolutely forbidden. And the second thing that it shows is that as the U.S. is willing to back down, even among its allies, Russia sees that it has a green light to flex its muscles and reassert its dominance within a region that it once dominated about 10, 15 years prior. So by crushing this Chechen terrorist movement in 05 and supporting separatist movements in Georgia in 2008, it's great um, headline news for Russian media because it shows that Russia is once again flexing its muscles exerting itself within the region and is no longer the pushover, humiliating whatever it was a decade beforehand. This is extended to Russia's reassertion of regional strength in Europe, right? Not just the former Soviet Union, but in Europe as well. Whereas Russia was completely incapable of stopping a U.S.-led coalition against Serbia in um, separating Kosovo from Serbia in 1999, Russia is now blocking any efforts at the UN to recognize Kosovo as an independent state. So you might think to yourself, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Russia just violated another country's sovereignty by supporting the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and Ossetia. And yet they are supporting Serbia's territorial integrity over Kosovo. So why this and not that in a different scenario? And the reason is very simple. Russia is engaged in good old-fashioned power politics. And the reason why it's doing so is because it calls out America's bluff, because it shows the United States is engaged in power politics as well. So whereas the United States supports the independence of Kosovo from Serbia in 1999, now Kosovo declares independence in February of 2008, okay, Russia is opposed to this. Serbia is opposed to this. China is opposed to this. But the United States still feels that this is a fait accompli and that it's just simply a matter of time before the opposition just rolls over and cannot withstand uh, U.S. diplomatic pressure. Until a few months later, and we're talking about August 2008, when Russia not only intervenes in Georgia, but then chooses to recognize the independence of these two breakaway movements, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Again, not because Russia is being hypocritical, but because they're waiting for the angry reply from the State Department. Now, mind you, this is already close to, um, you know, Barack Obama's term. Uh, I forget exactly when this is, but America is saying to Russia, hey, you can't do that. You are violating Georgia's sovereignty. You are literally taking territory away from a country. Well, Putin turns around and says, 
oh, so it's okay if you can do that to Serbia and you can scoff us for opposing this. But now all of a sudden you play the moral card and oppose Georgia's. Who's being the bigger idiot now? And the United States has no response to this. The United States still supports Georgia's territorial integrity, but supports Serbia's territorial disintegration. So it's not really a way of diminishing U.S. foreign policy as it is just pointing out the hypocrisy of it. And when Russia begins to start sounding like the bigger defender of international law than the United States, then you know that you're doing something wrong. Now, you jump a couple of years later to Russia's annexation of Crimea, and this is another like clear violation of another country's sovereignty. But again, the United States will not respond. Ukraine is not worth militarily defending, and Russia knows this. So they're playing these moves a little bit here and there and where the former Soviet Union went, testing America's resolve to see what are you going to do about it. And America is not going to do anything about it. Georgia is not worth going to war with Russia over. Ukraine is not worth going to, to war with Russia over. And so they know that they can flex their muscles in their own neighborhood. This, again, adds to Putin's popularity as someone who can stand up to American aggressive foreign policy. And then when you add to that the establishment of this so-called Eurasian Union, which is kind of like Russia's answer to the European Union, but includes a number of former Soviet republics, as well as China, Mongolia, uh, maybe even India as an economic free trade zone, you also begin to see that it's not just the European Union that can play with you know, economic free trade and communication, but the Eurasian Union is much more openly committed to just simply economic free trade. Right? There's no attempt at trying to um, overpower the sovereign governments of these countries. Right? So Putin is also playing into this idea that the European Union, while technically an economic customs union, is kind of very quietly eroding the political sovereignty of all of its members without formally declaring itself to be a federal government. The Eurasian Union basically says the opposite. The Eurasian Union is, says, keep your sovereignty, keep your laws, keep your borders. We're just simply trading. We're making it lucrative simply to trade without any tariffs or extra taxes. This puts money into the pockets of regional participants and continues to show the idea that Russia is kind of ready to re-engage the region, but not as the Soviet Union, but as a regional partner in this sense. Now, all of the things that I've been talking about so far are almost the entire vocation of the executive branch. Let's just spend a very brief amount of time talking about Russia's other elements of government. And there's not much to talk about, okay? And that's because the rest of Russia's government is, for all intents and purposes, weak and rubber stamp. So Russia does have a bicameral legislature, just like most parliamentary democracies. It has an upper house and a lower house. The upper house is the Federation Council. It is a body that is made up of representatives of all of Russia's federated states around the country. Okay? Now, the upper house must approve of all presidential nominees, decrees, and legislations. Now, by itself, that sounds like there's already some form of checks and balances. And yes, it did act as a check on Yeltsin's power. But under Putin, who has increased his ability at directly appointing regional leaders to office, the people who now make up the upper house are either people that he directly appoints or work for the people who directly appoint him. So it's really just simply a form of you know, approving, rubber stamp approving something that the presidency already comes up with. The lower house, the Duma, is much more of your national assembly in which people will vote for political parties. Half of these seats are proportional representation. The other half is single member plurality. It doesn't really matter as far as this lesson is concerned why one is what, why, where the other. The thing to understand about the Duma, that's, that's the name of the parliament, is that they have very weak legislative abilities. 
Now, there are multiple parties that make up the Duma, but the legislature is almost entirely dominated by Putin's United Russia Party. Okay. Now, the United Russia Party is interesting because it was a political party that was designed around Putin. You know, like in a lot of cases, um, you know, individuals emerge from pre-existing parties. Because Putin was appointed by Yeltsin, you know, at some point someone said to him, you know, it probably would look good if you are somehow attached to a political party. And he was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Make that happen. And I kid you not, the United Russia Party is basically a party that exists for Vladimir Putin. I mean, that is power, if you want my opinion. And, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out with all of this being said, I mean, if I haven't said it already, I mean, Vladimir Putin at this point is probably one of the most powerful people on the planet. Um, a couple of years ago, I would have said he was the most. At this stage of the game, he might be number two, uh, maybe number three. Um, right now, um, arguably, if you're wondering who is the most powerful person on the planet, uh, it might be Xi Jinping, the Chinese uh, party secretary. We're going to talk about him uh, next week. Okay? But, you know, this parliament basically shows that it serves at the discretion of the executive branch. Now, under Yeltsin, this parliament was divided and chaotic, right? And a big chunk of its parliament were made up by remnants of the Communist Party. Other political parties at the time hailed from you know, a wide spectrum of political parties, ranging from um, you know, the far right to the anarchist. In fact, I remember when I was in um, undergrad, and I took this class called Politics of Russia, and it was in the um, early to mid-1990s. And I remember reading this article, and it showed that the political parties that were running in Russian parliamentary elections, I think it was 93, 94, I don't remember. There was something like 80 political parties. 80 political parties. Now, mind you, you know, some of them were, you know, a lot more pronounced, like the communists that took, you know, about 40% of the vote. But then you had a whole bunch of other parties that were just kind of like created on the whim. I remember there was one that was just simply called the Russian Beer Lovers Party. I kid you not, the Russian Beer Lovers Party. I don't know what their platform was except for one thing, right? You can't go wrong with that. But what's their opinion about nuclear disarmament? What's their opinion about foreign policy? I don't know. Drink beer and everybody will be happy. So, you know, how many of these parties actually made it into office? And how many of them maybe had one seat, two seats, three seats each? So it really was a Weimarization of, you know, political gridlock. Um, under Putin, in this sense, parliament has become much more unified and organized, um, but is entirely dominated by him. Right? So once again, the United Russia Party, which forms the majority in the Russian Duma, um, is there largely for him. And if you were to ask me, um, who are some other prominent members of the United Russia Party, I can't tell you. Right? I mean, I, really, I can think of other prominent members in Russia's government, but they seem to be just handpicked by Putin. So I don't know what their political background happened to have been. So this, you know, leads to us to kind of sit back and think, all right, I mean, is there any hope for democracy in Russia? Because if everything that I've described to you is true, and why wouldn't it be, um, democracy is really non-existent in Russia. And again, this is a little bit of yes and no. Democracy as structure is very weak. Democracy as practice is a little bit more prominent. Now, again, as I said this in the previous lecture, if you were to go out into the street and ask average Russians, do you believe in democracy? Do you believe in democratic principles? The overwhelming majority of them would say, yes, we do. We always have. Um, but most Russians have very little faith in their democratic institutions, in their elected democratic officials. Right? They have very little faith that the local mayor or the local state governor or their local you know, Duma representative is anything more than just simply a, you know, a grasping, ambitious individual just trying to secure power, money, and position. Um, but more than that, the idea of democracy in Russia among Russian citizens is that they support Russia's democratic growth, but on Russia's terms. So the more that the West 
um, rails against the Russian system. The more that they, you know, chant free pussy riot, the more that they are critical of Putin, and the more that they will sympathize with and support governments in Ukraine and Georgia, whom they see as, you know, beleaguered democratic freedom fighters, but people in Ukraine and Georgia see as, you know, horribly corrupt individuals, sycophants and American bootlickers, uh, the more there is this visceral response to democracy by saying, well, we don't want your democracy, right? They'll turn around and say, well, look at what you're doing in America. Look at what, you know, Trump is doing. Look at what Obama promised and didn't do. Look at how the United States invades countries with, you know, without moment's thought in the name of regime change. Look at what you did to Iraq. Look at what you did to Libya. Look at what you were threatening to do with Syria and tell me if that is worth it. So, you know, this whole idea of believing in democracy among Russian citizens is they believe in its principles. They believe in its theories, but they don't believe that democracy grows from foreign incursions, and they point to a number of rotten transitions within the region. They look at Ukraine and they say, has Ukraine gotten any better since 2014? No, it's actually gotten worse. Has Georgia gotten any better since 2008? No, it's gotten worse. So when they look at the United States trying to sell itself as the champion of freedom and democracy around the world, and they say, look, you're operating on a a marketing scheme that the last time that it really worked was 1945. Um, you know, who wants to buy your product? Not me, right? So Putin may be authoritative. And yeah, he might be harsh and Spartan, and he might act like a czar, but he is seen as a safeguard against the chaos, not only from the 1990s, but the idea that the chaos of the 90s and the chaos of today in the surrounding areas is brought to you in no small part by the United States. So then what exactly do we call Russia, right? Because we can't call it a liberal democracy, right? There's no, it's, it's not a liberal democracy. Um, and here is where a lot of scholarly writings kind of diverge from each other. And oftentimes they try to compete by, you know, promoting one name over the other. It kind of, there's a lot of things that are, that are overlapping. But, you know, a lot of writings kind of look at Russia as a delegative democracy, right? A delegative democracy in which, you know, the president at the top wins an election that is generally free and fair, kind of, B minus C plus. But this president then governs as the sole authority through police and military. So it's almost like an electoral dictatorship, right? People run for office, the, the public votes for a paternalistic authoritative figure, and in turn, they rule by decree, right? And any second tier levels of government activity, they all function to curry favor from this president. So it's like electoral patronage. That's maybe... Not bad, but that's more of a criticism uh, than what actually happens in Russia. So maybe we can be a little bit more academically neutral and call Russia a managed democracy. It still has this, you know, top-down um, authoritative quality to it, you know, but the country kind of looks like a democracy. Um, you read the Constitution, and it seems like it's a democracy. But you spend some time there and you realize that the formal trappings are preserved and they're there, but they're really like House of Lords display purposes only. And all the power is controlled by the presidency. So it might even be like an illusory democracy. That's not bad either. But we maybe should opt for what Putin calls Russia or at least what his own inner circle labels it to be. And this is the concept of sovereign democracy. Okay? Sovereign democracy. It's probably the most complicated thing to take out of these two lectures this week. But like fascism, it needs to be described 
rather than defined. So, you know, in its most simplistic form, sovereign democracy is a type of custom design model of Russian democracy. Okay? We're not borrowing democracy from any other country. Right? We're not emulating America. We're not mimicking Germany. You know, we're not going up on Wikipedia to figure out what democracy really is. Because we don't know what it's going to be for Russia. But we're working on it. And we're trying to build it right now. We begin with the premise that Putin said, um, that I had mentioned last lecture, that the worst thing to ever happen to Russia was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's not because he's an old Marxist nostalgic, but the collapse of the Soviet Union meant the collapse of law, order, stability, institutions, direction, okay? Without any real preparation, right? So it's not like you have this ready-made government that you can sort of, you know, INC uh, when the British leave India. But, you know, Putin has gone on record multiple times to say that Russia was just not ready for democracy when the Soviet Union fell. Um, other countries might have been, but the country prematurely collapsed. And large parts of the country woke up the next morning to realize, oh, shit, we're not the Soviet Union anymore. What the hell? So this unpreparedness spiraled the country and the region into chaos and decay. And all one has to do is point to just the chronic level of mismanagement of Russia in the 1990s. So when Putin steps in, right, and he's going to be, you know, the sheriff that's going to clean up the town, this idea of sovereign democracy is that the state must restore its sovereignty first and build democracy second. In other words, before we talk about political rights and civil liberties... Before we talk about political pluralism, before we talk about whether or not we're going to hold a gay pride parade down the street of Moscow, we have more important things to worry about. We need to shore up the structural cohesion of the state. We need to stabilize its economy. We need to pacify unruly regions. We need to reconstruct, or better yet, construct a middle class. We need to produce a generation of competent bureaucrats. We need to modernize, standardize, and re-equip our military. And we need to build up our economy. These are all things that need to be in place before we even begin to talk about cosmetic democracy. Okay? It's kind of like saying, look, before we decide whether or not we're going to paint the walls blue or yellow, before we go to Ikea or Raymore and Flanagan, we have to build the goddamn house first. We also have to figure out, is this going to be one floor or two floors? We have to put up the structural, we have to build the structural foundations of the house. You haven't even dug a basement yet. And already you're talking about, how, you know, whether we're going to have curtains or blinds. So the idea of sovereign democracy is structural framework first. Foundation settling and rooting itself into the ground. Once we got that, then and only then can we go to Home Depot and start accessorizing. Because if we start doing this before the foundations of state are laid, we're going to get chaos. We're going to get political extremism. We're going to get all the type of mismanaged, you know, uh, political um, instability that we see in Iraq, in Libya, in Kosovo, in Georgia, in Ukraine, and anywhere else. So in order to make this stuff happen and last, sovereign democracy says that the United Russia Party, which, surprise, surprise, is the party of Putin, should rule almost uncontested, for 15 to 20, 25, however many years it happens to be. <coughs> Russia needs a founding father. Russia needs an ideological anchor. And Putin is going to be that old Praetorian that comes in after the Roman Empire falls, but offers some kind of old imperial 
um, philosophy on life, to stabilize sort of a post-imperial, a post-Soviet state. And that may explain why Putin comes back to power in 2012. That may also explain why Putin feels like he still needed to hang on after 2022. Okay? So in this sense, sovereign democracy calls for strict interpretation of the rule of law and constitutional limits on power. When you hear Putin talk about governing Russia, it is always about stability, about order, about following the Constitution. Yes, the Constitution is written and rewritten to support him, but this is the law, a strict adherence to laws, norms, and policies, not just in Russia, but even more so in the international community. And that means if Russia is going to be the one supporting Serbian and Syrian sovereignty, if you know, we're too late to defend Serbia from NATO's intervention, but we can prevent Kosovo from getting into the UN, in fact, we can actually work to undermine Kosovo's uh, quasi-legal, um, incredibly controversial independence in the name of international law. Because you can't just simply go in and tear a country apart here, there, everywhere. And my guess is that if the United States ever lets up on Kosovo and says, okay, you're right, you know, let's go back to basics, Russia will relinquish its support for Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But they're using it once again as a way of dragging out American hypocrisy. Russia was also a staunch defender of not only Syria's sovereignty, but the Assad government. Now, at this point, the Syrian civil war is winding down to its end. Um, a couple of years ago, I would have said that Assad's days are numbered. Today, uh, the government has not only turned the tide, but is now decisively in control. Now, the country is all but destroyed. But Putin's excuse for um, supporting Assad is not that he's supporting <coughs> war criminals. It's not that he's supporting dictators and mass murderers. He's basically saying, I'm supporting the legitimate government of Syria. If Assad is to ever be removed from power, he will be removed by the Syrian people, not by the CIA, not by the American military. Because once again, Putin is saying, we see what you did in Iraq. We see what you did in Syria. I'm sorry, uh, Libya. And don't try to tell me that these countries are better off today than they were under Saddam or under Gaddafi. And here's the thing. I shouldn't have to say that. I should not have to say that Libya was better under Gaddafi than it is now. I, I should not have to say that Syria is better under Assad than any alternative. But the facts are clear, right? Chaos, terrorism, political instability, ethnic cleansing, uh, demographic decline, migration, human rights violations, all of this stuff comes when you destroy the legitimate governments of states which is why Russia feels the need to intervene in Ukraine. Do you think, okay, so Russia's supporting Serbia sovereignty, Syria sovereignty, what's with Ukraine? They don't see the government in Ukraine as legit. They see them as an extension of the State Department and the CIA. And Russia's intervention, and this is kind of a loophole argument, but Russia's intervention in Ukraine is coming at the behest of the ethnic Russian speakers of Ukraine's south and east, that are calling on Russia for intervention to defend them against increasingly extremist governments in the Ukrainian capital. So Putin is kind of saying, I'm not doing this because of adventure. I'm doing this because the public, the Ukrainian citizenship, or at least part of the Ukrainian citizenship, is asking for our support. And we will support whatever they come to agreement with. But we will not support these groups being overrun and being destroyed by, a, by an illegitimate government in Kiev. Now, he can do all of this through a reorganized and rearmed Russian military. So by proving to the world that the Russian military is still a force to be reckoned with, this is a way of refashioning Russia as a strong emerging regional power. Now, you add to that one very important cultural or socio-cultural institution, the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and this is important to sort of uh, talk about just briefly, because as I mentioned in the previous lecture, 
The Russian Orthodox Church is probably the only institution in Russia that has the organization, the leadership, and the legitimacy to question Putin. And at times the church has called him out on his actions. The church did condemn Russia's intervention in Ukraine. They also condemned Russia's intervention in Georgia because of the increase in risk in human lives. However, the Russian Orthodox Church can also serve as the one sociocultural institution that can affirm Putin's leadership as well. And because, well, at least historically speaking, the Russian church is one of the most trusted institutions in Russia, it is in Putin's interest to remain in the church's good graces. Now, the current leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, um, is arguably speaking one of the most powerful people in Russia, maybe top five, definitely. Now, he and Putin get along quite well, right? Quite, quite well. And I think that there is this understanding of mutual respect between the two. This cooperative relationship has certainly worked. But Putin needs the church just as much as the church needs Putin. Putin, as far as the church is concerned, preserves Russia's integrity, its national um, I, you know, identity, um, and it asserts this idea that Russia is not a country that is going to be pushed around by the global West. But in Putin's case, he needs the church because there is nothing in Russia that is more Russian than the Russian Orthodox Church. And as a national church, it serves as really um, a repository of symbols and narratives of Russian heritage, culture, and memory. Right? Very similar to, let's say, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Serbian Orthodox Church, or the Catholic churches in Poland and Ireland, right? So it's like, it's not just a religious organization, but it's a socio-cultural organization that even among, you know, the non-religious, the non-attendees, they have to view these churches as critical to preserving and eventually developing a certain national identity, right? So, you know, you take Ireland, for instance, right? It is difficult, if not impossible, to view Irish history without the Irish Catholic Church um, involved. It is difficult, if not impossible, to view the Catholic Church in Poland um, as a way of resisting both German and Russian um, influence over the centuries. And, you know, as far as Russia is concerned, the Russian Orthodox Church is really one of the only institutions that uh, survived communism. Like everything else was largely destroyed. And trust me, the communist government tried multiple times to destroy the Russian church uh, before they decided to tacitly compromise with it. So if the Russian church can survive Stalin, better yet, if the Russian church can survive both Stalin and Hitler and World War II, uh, they can survive a lot of things. So the Russian church ain't going anywhere. And because it is much more of a national conservative institution than liberal progressive, um, it suits Putin's interest to work with the Russian church in that sense, right? So as I said, you know, national churches have this dual role of spiritual as well as cultural factors for a people, right? So just once again, if you didn't write this down, right, national churches um, serve as the repository for symbols of collective identity and narratives of collective memory. And in that sense, they function as a state in the absence of formal state institutions. So, like, the Irish Catholic Church was still an organization um, during the centuries where there was no country of Ireland. Right? The same thing for the Greek Orthodox Church, or the Serbian Orthodox Church, or the Romanian or the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, or the Armenian Orthodox Church uh, during the 500 or so years of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church first preserves the pre-communist Russian identity, but then even during the 1990s, where we're trying to figure out where's Russia going to go, what's this, what's that, 
the Orthodox Church is far more organized and far more with it than politics were. And there were a lot of people in Russia in the 90s that, I don't want to say fled to the churches because it means that they would become monks or nuns, but they looked to the church for guidance, for leadership, for direction, for some kind of moral compass. So this is something that Putin is definitely going to use when appropriating this type of renewed um, and reinvigorated Russian identity. And the last part uh, with our discussion is going to focus on state-led economic growth. You know, we can um, look at Putin's leadership as kind of making Russia great again. But one thing that cannot be um, underestimated or unappreciated is the idea that the economy in Russia began to revive. And in the um, 2000s, especially after 9-11 and the war on terror, uh, the price of gas, the price of oil just went up. And so as a rentier state or as a quasi rentier state, right, the Russian economy skyrockets in the 90s, I'm sorry, in the 2000s and the 2010s as the price of oil and gas goes up and as Russia begins to flex its muscles in building more pipelines, more oil uh, contracts with neighboring countries. Okay? And this is a strong indicator of economic growth that is attributed to Putin's economic acumen. There's another thing to take into account here, folks. When the economy is doing good, the person who's at the front gets all the credit. Sometimes they don't have to do anything at all. And when the economy is bad, who do we blame? The captain goes down with his ship or gets praised. So whereas the Russian economy was kind of sputtering and fluttering in the 1990s and, you know, Yeltsin was given the blame for it, the economy begins to rebound. Putin is given all the credit, right? And you look, if, if this coronavirus uh, was not the case, the Dow, uh, you know, effectively increased by, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 points. I mean, at one point we were close to 30,000. Trump has taken all the credit. Everybody's saying Trump's making us money, Trump's making us money, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, let's see where this economy is by November. I still think that Trump's going to get reelected if Biden is foisted on us, but that's a different story. But, you know, when Putin is, you know, kind of reasserting Russia's greatness, um, the economy is also reinforcing his legitimacy. His leadership does take a, you know, a tumble a little bit when the Russian economy begins to contract after Crimea, right? And that is because a number of sanctions are slapped onto Russia uh, that close some markets with Europe and the United States. But it's not as bad as many economists in the United States would think. Because at this point, Russia's got money that's kind of, you know, holed away. Russia does a far better job of being a rentier state than Venezuela does. Because Russia's saving money for an occasion like this. And what do they do? When the economy is doing bad and they can't buy from the West, they will open up new trade deals and new economic arrangements with India or China or Iran or Africa for that matter. Or at the end of the day, trust me, there is one country in Europe that hates to be the defector in collective embargo with Russia, but they'll be the first ones to do it if need be, and that's Germany. So, you know, a, a good way of looking at this, and this map is a little outdated, but it gets the point across. When we talk about Russia's economy relying on oil and natural gas, we have to look at Russia's pipeline network. And the pipelines that you see here are maybe at best 20%. Right? These are the big ones. There are dozens and dozens of other pipelines that snake their way through Russia into neighboring countries. But there's a couple of things that I want to show you here, and we'll you know, pretty much uh, end. Uh, let me just take a look here. Yeah, we're going to end after this map. Here. Forget that extra slide. There's two main pipelines that I want to talk about. You have what's called North Stream and South Stream. Okay. Now, there's a thing to understand here. The pipelines that carry oil and uh, natural gas, their goal here is to reach Central Europe, the big economies. So you got Germany, you got Austria, you got Italy, you got France, you got Great Britain. These countries depend on Russia 
for their gas. Some of them are supplied by 80, 90% of Russian gas. Now, in order to reach these countries, these pipelines have to go through Central Europe, right? The former Warsaw Pact areas, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and here's the former Soviet Union. Here's Ukraine, here's Belarus. Now, what Russia does to get these pipelines to reach Central Europe is that they have the money, they have the diplomatic clout, and they have the leverage to buy out any domestic oil and energy company in Russia, in, in these countries, to which they receive at the minimum 51% of all shares. So in so many words, Russia buys out the competition, right? And with the idea of you don't have to worry about maintaining uh, your nascent little, you know, pathetic energy companies in the face of our, you know, vast amounts of resources, right? You just connect with our pipelines, we'll take care of the rest. You know, you either, you know, you pay us, a, you know, an, a monthly or an annual rent and we'll just supply the gas. We take care of everything. But in order to have the gas reach here, a lot of these countries have to pay Russian rates. And whenever there is a problem, especially in Ukraine, they feel that they are somehow held economic hostage by Russia. Because you've got people on this end of the pipeline that are constantly telling people here and here, hey, you know, cut the crap, I want my gas. Because if Ukraine decides that they are somehow shortchanged or there's a problem with politics or Crimea or whatever it happens to be, Ukraine can always refuse to pay. Right? I'm not paying for your gas. I am shutting off the valves, whatever it happens to be. I am protesting. Russia anticipates this. And in many cases, they don't even care. And why is that? Very simple. If Ukraine or Belarus or any of these countries refuse to pay their monthly or annual bill, Russia does what any energy company does. Okay, I'm just going to shut off the power, you know, quick, 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 you know, to close off the valve. You only got to do is wait. Russia doesn't care. You want to know why? Because if the valve is cut off at Ukraine, guess who also doesn't get any gas? Poland, Slovakia, Austria, and here's where it gets interesting, Germany or Italy. All Russia has to do is wait a couple of days. There'll be a phone call coming in from a very irate and angry German going, where's the gas? And Russia's like, I'm sorry, Ukraine no pay gas. What do you want? Germany gets on the horn, tells Ukraine to basically cut the crap. <laughs> Whatever problems you have, we're going to work through, but I want my gas. Remember, Germans don't like the cold, especially the Russian cold. So the idea is that what Russia does is Russia has more economic leverage over this area than they did during the Cold War. You don't have to occupy this area with the Red Army. You can just simply buy out the energy. And because some of these lines are dotted rather than straight, it gives you this impression that Russia will build more and more of these to extend its leverage, influence, and control. Now, North Stream has been completed. And the whole goal of Nord Stream here is to just add one more pipeline that is directly going to Germany, just to increase Germany's dependency on Russian gas. But take a look also at the countries that it bypasses, right? This is Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia former members of the Soviet Union that are vehemently anti-Russian, anti-Soviet, anti-communist, we're in Europe, screw you, blah, blah, blah. Putin's like, great, I don't care, do whatever you want, but I hope you have enough wood to keep you warm, <laughs> you know? I hope you have enough oil reserves, because trust me, at some point you're going to need us. And when you do, call us, because we are extending our influence here in Europe, so Europe is not going to get rid of us at all. The one that was halted, and this is an interesting one, is South Stream. Okay? Now, the, idea, the original idea of South Stream was to kind of do to Europe what North Stream did. But in this case, what South Stream does is it you know, leaves here from Russia, goes under the Black Sea, and it stops here in Bulgaria. And what this does <clears throat> is it tries to reintroduce or reassert Russia's influence in the one remaining region of Europe that is still kind of up for grabs, and that's the Balkans. So it will go through Bulgaria, and by the way, these countries in green are members of the European Union. These are not. 
So Russia is going to have its pipeline go from Varna through to the Bulgarian city of Pleven. There, South Stream divides into South Stream 1 and South Stream 2. Goes down through Bulgaria into Greece. Screw you, Macedonia. Screw you, Albania. I don't care. Into Greece across the Adriatic and into Italy. The north one is going to go up through Bulgaria, into Serbia, screw you Croatia, into Hungary, and then back and divide even further into Austria, Slovenia, and then Austria again. What this does is it aims to basically bring Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia, Hungary, Slovenia, and Italy into greater dependency on Russia. Okay. Now, South Stream was halted when the pipeline was about to reach Bulgaria. Bulgaria was told by the European Union, do not accept this deal. Do not accept Russian blackmail. So Bulgaria says, we don't want it. Okay. Now, Putin is not one to get angry. Putin's like, okay, no problem. In fact, um, he was at a press conference about a year or two ago in Turkey. And he was talking with the Turkish president, uh, Recep Erdogan, and um, a journalist had said to him, what are you going to do now that South Stream is halted at Bulgaria? And he may have had this already planned, but he's like, well, I guess I could always, instead of building it through the Black Sea into Bulgaria, I guess I could just extend it here and into Turkey and then he turns to Erdogan and says, what do you think? You want to do that? And Erdogan's like, yeah, sure, why not? So the idea of a new South Stream would be to bypass Bulgaria altogether, build a pipeline that is happening already, across the straits, and stop at the Greek border. Just literally stop. Now, Greece, as you know, is an economic dire straits. And the pressure among Greek nationalists, conservatives, and others to continue that pipeline through Greece is going to put enormous pressure on any government in Greece. So the idea is, hey, Bulgaria, you don't want it? No problem. I'll just bypass you as well. We'll go through Greece. And at that point, hey, Serbia, you said you wanted it? Awesome. Well, we're going to, at some point, extend this pipeline to Serbia, uh, Macedonia, you want in? Bulgaria, you sure you don't want in or whatever it is? They're already building the pipeline in Serbia. So the idea is, is that we're going to just do it anyway. But now we've got Turkey's approval as well. Does the EU have the leverage to counter that? Does the EU have any economic alternatives? The answer is currently no. And especially in the last few years under the Trump administration, there really has been no uh, major opposition to countering uh, these pipelines. In fact, just to show you how utterly dependent countries that might not be Russia's friends are, Ukraine, since the annexation of Crimea, openly proclaims itself to be Russian free of all gas. But how does this work? They get their gas from Slovakia. Okay, Slovakia is a little country right here. I can't imagine that Slovakia is a big competitor with Russia. No. The pipelines continue to go through Ukraine, but there's no spigot. <laughs> it goes through Ukraine without anybody tapping them, and it goes into Slovakia. A hundred meters in, the pipeline literally 180s and goes back into Ukraine, <clears throat> where Ukrainian government officials now buy their gas from Slovakia. Right? So Slovakia takes Russian gas directly. Charges, I can only imagine a percentage. They're making money hand over fist by this. Ukraine is paying an extra amount just so they don't get Russian gas. What does Russia care? We don't care at all. Slovakia is living it up. You know, Ukraine is, can say that they are Russian gas free, but, you know, nobody can see this. No, everybody can see this. I'm sorry. All right. So that basically gives us to where we are today with Russia. Right. And we can certainly talk a lot about Russia. Um, online, in discussion forums. Uh, we can talk about Russia, uh, you know, in Zoom chats, right? There's a lot of stuff to really do here. But this kind of brings us uh, to, you know, really up to the present period. And, uh, you know, the following week, we will look at a true authoritarian state, uh, China. But I hope that you have, you know, understood 
all of this. And I hope that you have kind of processed that it's more than just simply memorizing Russian politics, but figuring out why things operate uh, the way that they do. So make certain that you've got all of this down. If you want to speak with me in any way to make certain that you understand this, I am available whenever. But let's move forward into our final case study and start thinking about your writing assignment that is due at the end of the semester. You know, we haven't gotten, I haven't gotten any indication from the university as to whether we are extending the grading period or moving to pass-fail. I don't know. So some of you I am in touch with. Others, I wonder where you are. I hope you're well. <laughs> I really hope that I do. Uh, but give me some signal that you are alive. Uh, but anyway, stay tuned. Uh, take care. Stay safe. And uh, I will see you online.